A lot of technique when you go outside is it's so much harder. Footholds are smaller, handholds are smaller. Something that's graded V2 inside versus something that's graded V2 outside are honestly not even in the same realm for some people. Hey y'all, I'm Ryan Devlin and welcome to the Struggle Climbing Show's Pro Clinic on Gym to Crag with someone who knows a little bit about the topic, Alex Johnson. AJ has been a force on plastic and rock for a long time now. Indoors, she's won nationals five times and has two World Cup gold medals. And outdoors, she's bouldered over a hundred V10s, dozens of V12s, and all the way up to the V14 masterpiece, The Swarm. She knows what she's talking about, y'all. And today, Alex breaks down common challenges and offers pro tips for beginner, intermediate, and advanced climbers whether you're a boulderer or you're roping up, whether you're planning your first trip outdoors or are looking to bust through plateaus and send your mega proj, this clinic covers it all. And then it wraps up with some bonus content on how AJ is training her fingers as she recovers from a pretty mega knee injury so that she can come back stronger than ever. And you know she's got some strong fingers, so that's some awesome bonus content. This pro clinic is made possible by patrons and subscribers of the show. If that is you, thank you. I love you. You get access to this entire episode as well as the growing library of pro clinics and ad free episodes. And if you're not a patron or an Apple subscriber, I still love you. And I would love for you to consider joining the struggle community if you can. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit here. But first, let's break some beta and get ready to crush outdoors with Alex Johnson. Just kind of set the set the table for us with regard to what gym to crag or indoor to outdoor kind of means to you, and certainly you've coached a lot of people, I'm sure, that have been um, at various levels of going down this kind of road of of balancing indoors and outdoors. So, you know, what is what is just kind of in the big picture? What is gym to crag mean? So, I think especially with like the exponential growth of the sport. Indoor climbing is sort of almost becoming its own sport and outdoor climbing is something that I think a lot of new climbers maybe will never tap into. Like some people will only be gym climbers for their entire life. And that's totally fine because that's like kind of the way the sport seems to be going. It's like with skateboarding, it's like you could only be like an indoor park, you know, like a park skater, you'll never do like street skate. And so it's like whatever you have as your resource is like, if that's what you love to do, and then there's like so many people who love to do that, amazing. But with the growth of the sport in general and people climbing outside or inside, more people are going to want to climb outside. And I think having a really sound knowledge base before you approach that is really important because they're so different. The style is different. The risks are different. They honestly could not be more different. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And it does seem like Whereas in the past, and I say the past, maybe like 20 years ago, gyms were set up in a way to help people get ready to go outside. Now, to your point, it's almost indoor climbing is almost a, a style of its own. And so how much does gym climbing in general prepare people for outdoor climbing anymore? I think as far as indoor prepping you for outdoor the, honestly, the the major, if not only connection is just like strength. A lot of technique when you go outside is it's so much harder. Footholds are smaller, handholds are smaller. Something that's graded V2 inside versus something that's graded V2 outside are honestly not even in the same realm for some people. Um, so true. Most people find climbing outside significantly harder. And yeah. even like the same grade, like you're like a V7 climber inside you're maybe projecting before outside. Yeah, I'd love your perspective on, on why you think that is. I think it's it's cool for us to kind of cover this as part of an overview to talk about grades a little bit, and then we'll, you know, we'll dive into our chapters here. I was just out at the Craft Boulders recently um, doing, I did a little trip to Las Vegas where I did a, a day of sport out at Potosi, and I did a, a day of bouldering out at the Craft Boulders, and I'm not a very strong boulderer. People who listen to the podcast know that I'm more of like a long endurance climber at my finger strength lacks and that kind of thing. So inside I'll do, you know, up to V5 
And out at craft, I was like getting smacked by V3. Like, you know, hard. It was it was hard for me to climb. I didn't climb a V4. <laughs> and so it was kind of humbling. Um, but I was still having a blast and it was great. It was also like a style thing, like like on the monkey bar boulder. I, I, I could do like those longer, more juggy type climbs that are kind of the the steeper, like overhanging climbs like I do at the Red River Gorge, whereas the more thin stuff was very hard for me. Like the potato chip. I don't know if that goes V3 and or something V2. like that. V2, I mean, fucking hell. Like, that is that is a really so hard out boulder. So, yeah, like, as you're, um, from your experience, from, you know, having a lot of experience indoor as well as outdoor and certainly working with the clients that you do now, how do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile kind of the grades of indoor boulders versus outdoor? What's funny, I think, is that you get to a certain point, and for me, it flips. And I find indoor climbing at a certain grade to be significantly harder than outdoor climbing. Like uh-huh. I've never climbed V12 inside. I don't even mm-hmm. think I've ever climbed V11 inside. But I've done like 40 V11s outside and like 15 or something V12s outside. What, what happens there? I don't know. Is If it's like friction or just like subtleties or projecting. But I think inside up to it, like when you hit a certain point inside, maybe it's like V8. I think it gets significantly more powerful and a lot of climbing outside VA and hard. You like, you don't find that super gymnastics, maybe in Waco, like gymnastic style, powerful climbing outside, like you do in the gym where it's like steep and you jump from a pinch to a pinch and you're like, your feet are cutting. And it's like, there's a certain point where inside is so much easier than outside up to like be four, five, six. And then there's a point where I think it flips and it's like B eight and up inside is way harder like i'll go to momentum i'm like projecting v8 and then outside it's like <laughs> yeah, like warming up on v8 how interesting is that well that's perfect because i was going to ask you kind of wh- where if you've struggled or where you struggle in this and it, it sounds like that's it's not something that i would understand because i don't climb at that level but how interesting to, to understand that the paths cross at, at some point in time where inside yeah. you're you know it goes from easier than outside to ultimately harder and it's right around v6 v6 okay maybe seven i feel like some of the sevens some of the sevens in the the gym can be like a little powerful yeah and and i think it's good too to kind of set the table here on just the fact that while this may seem obvious it's maybe worth spending a couple seconds talking about problems in the gym are set by humans Mm -hmm. and problems outside are set by nature and discovered by humans and and this kind of thing but you always hear i mean it's just the age-old thing where it's like well a v5 at my gym is like a v3 at your gym and you know there's there's a difference in types of sets and types of setters and types of holds and angles of walls and in this kind of thing so um what's your take on that because you've you've spent a lot of time at a lot of different gyms um you certainly climb outside plenty have you ever been a setter i have set i have set i wouldn't say that i've ever been a setter i have set i think even not actually putting holds on the wall, but like with the tension board too in the garage, sure. setting my own boulders on it. I think I have a reputation for my boulders being pretty stiff um, unintentionally. So like I'll, Fest came over, we did this thing, like we were like having a session in the garage and it was like a lot of the V7s I was putting up, she was like, this is probably V9. And I'd be like, oh, I don't, I don't know. Like if it's like, I have a weird, it's weird. And so I think if I were a setter, my, my great, I would be like, a little sandbagged because I'd rather yeah. something be on the stout end than the soft end for sure. And I think it like prepares you better for outside. Like there's not really ego in it. I don't know. And I think the way that someone moves and like style and height and like a crimpy V7 for me would be really easy. And like a slopey V7 for me would be really hard. So it's like, there's so many variables that go into it. What, what can climbers expect in a general sense from you know how they can prepare themselves at the gym to get outside and have an enjoyable experience outside first and most importantly try to go with someone who has experience and someone you trust someone who climbs outside a lot and i think for me it was like a mentorship like i was always climbing with older guys at my gym and they would take me bouldering and sort of like teach me everything i needed to know which is everything i'm about to share with everyone else yes going with someone experienced and someone you trust will make that whole experience one, significantly safer, and two, significantly more enjoyable. But until you, like, find that person that you're really comfortable with, I think 
in terms of getting ready physically to climb outside, I would probably try to grab like as many crimps or small holds as possible. Like I tend to lean even in the gym, like I'll see, I'll see a boulder and be like, Ooh, that looks sick. Like I want to do that one. And Melina will be like, yeah, of course, like, of course that's the boulder in the gym that you're gravitating towards because it's all crimps up like a 40 degree face. And I'm like, well, yeah. And she was like, but this is the most like outdoor climbing boulder in the gym right now. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's what I'm good at. And so it's like something that has smaller holds and crimps. You're not really going to find a lot of slopers outside kind of ever. Even the slopers you do find outside have like little edges on them. Like they're just, I mean, unless you're like climbing bum boy in the South or something, most of outdoor climbing is like edges and crimps. So as much of that as you can do, and honestly, like slab invert with really small feet, like super, super small, really precise footwork that like, and then you're going to get outside. And you won't be surprised by how small the feet are because- most people I take climbing outside for the first time or like the clinics I've done with beginners are like, oh, there's no feet. And I'm like, no, there are tons of feet. They're just, they're really small. And that's not, there's not, there's no feet. You just have to know and expect for them to be way smaller and way worse. Yeah, totally. You're used to these like big neon holds that stick out from the wall and you can just slam your foot on them wherever you want. And and that's certainly, that's one of the, been the, one of the biggest shocks for me in moving from predominantly bouldering in a gym to, to outside. I mostly route climb outside, but when I go bouldering outside, it's always the feet. And so this is kind of a perfect segue here, AJ, to talk about now the beginner chapter, right? We're going to we're gonna break this pro clinic into beginner, intermediate, and advanced, as we always do here. And we've, we've touched on some good general stuff here. Let's dive in specifically with a lens on beginners. And I think um, if it makes sense here, maybe for, for purposes of this pro clinic, a beginner... Uh, regardless of the grade that you climb, let's just say a beginner is someone who's never climbed outside, right? And and maybe you're a V0 or V1 climber inside and, and you're just looking to get out to the blocks for the first time, or maybe you're a V8 climber inside and you're really strong and experienced and you just have been a gym climber and now you're thinking about wanting to get out there. You want to you go out and try your hand on some some outdoor boulders that's that's a beginner for purposes of this conversation and of course feel free to to kind of recraft that as you want but let's at least start there and um what do you see for a beginner kind of what jumps out at you for somebody who is first starting to to explore getting outside i think for the most part they're shocked at how much more difficult climbing outside is and there are like athletes that i know who have done world cups and they just like don't like climbing outside. And I think for the most part, it's because it's so different and so much harder in a different way. Like you've got like nationally ranked World Cup level indoor climbers who like struggle outside. And I've seen that for like years. It's not just like there's not one person I think, you know, like it's like kind of across the gamut. And unless you do it, like the more you do it, the easier it comes, like for sure. But um Unless you do it consistently, it's really hard. There's a high learning curve, but then once you figure it out, like it's, I think it makes your indoor climbing significantly better because you trust your feet. And then uh, back to the foothold thing, like footholds are so much smaller that you, and sequencing, like you said, there's no neon holds, there's no tape, there's no, like, it's harder to sequence. So you have to look like specifically for chalk and like black shoe rubber. Um, so with sequencing, it's like in the gym, it's pretty straightforward. It's like, hold, 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 finish. The finish is taped <laughs> that side. It's like right. trying to figure out where something starts can be really difficult and sort of just figuring out where and how something goes because it's rock. Maybe it rained and the chalk got washed off. And so you're looking for holds, you're looking for chalk, you're looking for shoe rubber. Like there's signs where you can follow and like try to sequence. And because the footholds are so much smaller, they're usually also significantly more textured, whether it's hands or feet. So overgripping is something that is done a lot in the gym. And I think you have to learn to like trust in the friction outside, whether it's the friction of your skin or the friction of your shoes. Yeah, you know, this idea of, of not knowing exactly where to go, I think is a perfect uh, opportunity for us to talk for, for beginners here. But this really, this really goes into all levels um, at the gym. It is clear where you need to go. The holds are either monochromatic and, and you know you're going to the next blue hold or they're taped. And so, again, it's very clear what's on and what's off. And, and of course, when you're outside on a boulder, if you're doing a boulder, everything's on unless you're, you know, linking up problems. But 
there's a lot more options, but also a lot more confusion about what's on. And, and not only when things wash off, like you just said, um, what, like if, if chalk washes off, but also where you're climbing overhung routes like I do at the red, sometimes everything is chalked. And then it's unclear what's on because maybe somebody just hung at a bolt and they were just touching everything around them with chalky hands. And now if you're going for a flash or if you're just, you know, making a red point go, you might need to know what is actually good and chalked versus what's bad and chalked. So talking about the sequencing, I, I think is important. What, what can you do in the gym before we go out to the crag? Is there anything that we can do to practice that? This is sort of where volume climbing could come in really handy. It's sort of like you're climbing on like more blank features that don't have something as specifically laid out for you. So if there's something in the gym, let's say there's like a volume climb, try to like work it and every time you do it, eliminate a hold or like start by eliminating all the feet. Because a lot of climbing outside is like smearing and texture and like bad footholds. And so in keeping your heels down, like, what that means is if you're standing on a foothold, let's say like this is the foothold, <clears throat> and your toe is up, you're not getting very much rubber connecting with the rock. And so outside, that's even more important than inside. Inside, you can just kind of put your toe on and it'll stay because it's usually like a big enough foot. But outside, if it's like a seam, basically, or a crack and you're standing on it, when you drop your heels, you get way more surface of the shoe and the rubber connecting with the texture of the rock. And like this is literally what shoes are designed for. Like that's why there's rubber all here so the more friction you have the more pressure you put on your shoes the more friction you create thus the stickier they get and it's like a strange concept that's like you have to push down to go up but the harder you press the more friction you create and so outside especially like standing on the small footholds dropping your heel putting pressure on them like we usually we have foot slips because we ease up on the pressure so as soon as you like ease up on the pressure even inside your foot's gonna slip because that that friction is like has been removed or lessened right. so it's like trusting that trusting the texture of the rock trusting the texture of the like the friction of the rubber like this is what they're literally designed to do and so doing that inside on volumes with your feet i think is really important so like standing on super small feet smearing the more you eliminate the more like outdoor climbing it's going to get <laughs> yeah i love this i think the there's something very counterintuitive about the foot slip that is still hard for me to understand. And I've been climbing for a minute, you know, where my default setting is that I think the more pressure I put on a foot, the the higher the probability it is that I'm gonna that I'm gonna slip off or I'm gonna pop off. But but you're so right. The reality is not that. The reality is if you can hold the tension from the foot through to your hands, you're solid, you're pressing into that rock. It's as soon as you let up on that tension that's when it scums off or it pops. And I love practicing that in the gym as well on whether it's some volume, some smaller feet, um, or like you're saying, just even the wall, right? Like you could get on something that might be vert or slightly slab, and then you're using the handholds on the route, but you're literally just cutting out the feet altogether, right? Well, yeah, that's interesting. I love that. What about for kind of the sequencing inside is there a way to try to approximate that how could we practice not knowing exactly where we're supposed to grab a hold in the right spot probably for the most part it's climbing a little more statically just like when we were talking about how like you hit that grade threshold inside and things get significantly more powerful outside that's way less common in a lot of the style of outdoor climbing for the most part, up to a certain grade, is it's very static and usually very controlled. You're not like really hucking for things outside like you like you would do inside. And so the way right. I think the more you can control that sort of like slow static strength, I think the better time you're going to have outside because instead of like yeeting up to a rail where it's maybe bad, you can kind of like position, like go slow strength, like use your muscles a little bit. Or like shift your hips in a way where you hit it slow. And if it's bad, you can like, you're locked in. So you kind of bounce around. You're not like. Right. Indoor climbing tends to be very dynamic. It uses a lot of momentum. There's a lot of flow. And outdoor as well. But like, I would say probably significantly less for the most part. Yeah, that that is interesting. And, and that's obviously a great drill that can be done inside is to is to practice locking off or, or climbing slowly, more statically. And 
then when you get outside, yeah, if you need to search around for something, you can hold yourself in place. And I do see that. Like a lot of you all, when I see you, you know, and Allison and others that, that are out there climbing, you know, really hard outside, it tends to be like you're reaching up to something, locking off on it, pulling up, holding yourself there for a second, getting the next thing. It's like there's so much tension. Mm -hmm. There's so much precision with the footwork that it just couldn't be done if you were like, you know, swinging yourselves around like crazy. So I think that makes a lot of sense for for kind of that practicing of, of the indoors. Do you see for staying on this kind of beginner section for a second, those who have never been outdoors, what else do they tend to wrestle with? Topping out, if you've never talked out before, is difficult and terrifying because there's like a whole other element, like it adds another dimension where instead of just, you're just climbing, then all of a sudden you're like hanging over the lip you can't see your feet. You're like searching around for like what to grab. And you're like, and then you just do the same thing with your feet. Like your feet are kind of doing this. And then you're like getting super extended. And then everything sort of becomes obsolete. And then you just beach whale. And then you kind of like slide off. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Really, really scary. And so off, like often I'll go up the backside. One, you figure out how to go down because you go, you find the path of least resistance that you go up. I go up the backside and come down and like find and chalk a bunch of holds on the top out. Like, especially if I know the top out is going to be hard, find all the holds, chalk them, tick them, like make it as safe as possible. And then when you're up there, then you know, like, okay, I'm grabbing this and I'm grabbing this, I'm grabbing this. And you know exactly where they are. And a, a big mistake is people tend to get too spread out. Like their feet stay really low. And then they're just like reaching as far back as they can because they think that that's what's going to help. Like the farther back you go, the better. But the farther back you go, right. the farther down your feet stay. You lose all that space between your body and the rock and it makes it impossible to bring your feet up. Mm -hmm. You kind of want to stay like in a little bit of a small box and then keep bringing your feet up higher before you're like going back and back and back. <clears throat> Topping out is scary. Well, I love that we're talking about this, and this may flow into kind of the intermediate and advanced as well, because, you know, whatever you're climbing, you're going to be topping out. But I do think that that's, that is something that's very different uh, from indoor bouldering to outdoor bouldering for the most part. This is, certain gyms will have some top outs, and I've, I've been to, you know, a couple um, that, but it's, but it's still different because the, the holds protrude from the wall in a gym. So even if you're topping out on a slab top out at a gym, there's still going to be like a chunk of a blue hold that like you can see right there. And, and yeah, you don't have that. You never beach whale at a gym top out, you right. know, but, but outside you'll throw your whole body on something um, as you're terrified of doing a slow motion peel. Uh, so I think that's, that's really critical is, are there any other ways that you can practice that? Like sometimes I'll see, I don't know which video I was watching. I'll have to, well, you can tell me or I can, I can pull a clip from it, but, but like you had a ladder out, like were you, you know, like, are you bringing a ladder out to kind of practice like that top out or is that more to kind of like just clean holds that you can't quite reach and that kind of thing? Both. Usually I had a ladder this warm. Um, I think that's the only thing I've brought a ladder to. So it was probably. Oh yeah. The storm. Cause you were, you were kind of like skipping past that, like really hard, like second move. Right. Totally. And that was for like working middle moves and the top out of the storm is actually like really easy thankfully but there were a lot of circumstances where like blackout for example best and i like rehearsed the top out of blackout because like it's not like the most heinous top out there is but it's not it's not like super a gimme and so like you do all this work you climb the v13 part of the boulder like you don't want to blow it on the top out <laughs> so, right there were like not and why would admit that it wasn't 100% sendage every time, you know, like the top out. And so we get on and do the top and like every day we were there, we would do the top out like a couple times before starting to work it from the bottom because one, it's like a little scary. Just the landing is a little, it's a little weird. Um, and two, it's like, it's not easy. It's like pretty flat. It's just a sloped angle. It's pretty flat. You grab the lip, you throw your heel kind of in this arbitrary spot, and then you just like roll. It's like as toppy outy, the most cliche top out ever. It's like not not gimme. So you practice that like we practice that several times. Um, right. And then there was blue steel, which is that highball V eight here. I practiced the top top out of that on a rope several times. Yeah. Like the risk of falling there 
was like so not worth it. And it's yeah. it was the hardest part of the boulder. But again, it like was not easy. And you're trusting this crystal of a foot. Like your hands are just like on the lip. You're trusting this crystal of a foot and like rolling over the same thing. You roll over the top, press down on the foot. And it's like the sketchiest getting out of a pool. Top boats can be sort of like maybe not the crux of the climb, but like at least the red point crux. And also if you're scared, really important really important to rehearse top out. I do that a lot. I do rehearse top out a lot. And you do see that, you know, you'll see that on, on, on people who work high balls where they'll they'll work sequences on a rope um, or to take it to like the ultimate extreme, like Honold on the free rider, you know, rehearsing the whole thing on a rope before doing the solo. It, it makes sense. Like you don't, not every climb we do has to be, be an onsite. You right. know, yeah, you start at the bottom and get to the top. You can You can sort these things out. So you get, when you get up there and fear can take over, you've got confidence and you've got some muscle memory of how to do a sequence that you know you can do. I think my highball days are over. Oh yeah? But I don't know, that's fine. I did, a, I've done a lot of highballs in my day. I think I've done highballs that people don't even know about. And then like people will do them and be like, yo, so-and-so did this highball. And I'm just like, yeah, I did that in 2008. I don't know. <laughs> Before there was Instagram. Yeah, I, you know? yeah. If, if it's not on the gram, did it happen? I don't right. know, man. T t highballs, highballs are, uh, y'all are breeding your own, you know? Yeah. There's like a, a space you enter, like a headspace you enter. That's like, unless you do it, maybe it's not that easy to understand. You get in a space where it's really calm. Mm -hmm. If you're panicking, you're fucked. And I think right. that's like what those of us who have done highballs are like free solo. It's really cool. It's a really cool space to access. Oh, yeah, I can't even imagine. It's It's got to be like, you know, hitting the flow state times a thousand when you're working a, a high ball, you know, where the stakes are really high and you just absolutely have to be in the zone and executing. And, you know, probably doesn't apply to a lot of us listening right now, especially as we're talking here in the beginner chapter. But, you know, for me, I hate ground falls. I think everybody probably dislikes ground falls, but I have a, a low um, threshold for that kind of potential injury. And so that's why I, I err towards the side of sport climbing. But I think, you know, there's still this opportunity and it, and it happens for so many of us. That's why we love climbing to dip into that flow state while we're climbing, whether it's on a top rope or on lead uh, or bouldering, you can still, you're still contending with fear. And I loved us talking about kind of topping out boulders here on the sports side. I think it's also similar where outside um, if you're lead climbing on sport, it's going to be a much different feel than when you're in the gym and the draws are fixed and the anchors are only maybe 30 feet up or 40 feet up. And yeah, it's just a totally different uh, vibe, obviously being outside. And, and so I think there's more opportunity because of that to dip into the flow state. I, I feel like at least, is that your experience as well? You feel the exposure more, like maybe you're not higher outside, but when you're like your peripheral, like is more vast and so it's there is a lot it's a lot scarier in a way that's like you just have to focus you gotta focus a little more yeah yeah i agree i think that's a good point too because like even if you're bouldering outside maybe the boulder is only 12 feet tall and in the gym maybe a problem is 12 feet tall but when you're looking around uh like i was out in leavenworth just recently and like you're up high already and you're looking at these like really awesome peaks and it, it just yeah that that exposure just feels higher than when you're at the gym and the entire floor is padded and there's just people walking around sipping coffee and this kind of thing. And so it's just another special aspect, I think, to to being outside, even if the the, the distance of a potential fall is is the same, you're still working through that mental game in unique ways. And so I think that's that's a great kind of opportunity for us to now shift to the intermediate climber here. And again, not so much focusing on grades in this sense, because we're talking about indoors to outdoors. So maybe we'll focus on a climber, whether that's a boulderer or a sport or trad climber, who has spent a little bit of time outdoors, uh, but still predominantly spends their time inside, maybe because they're not close to an outdoor crag or just because they, they haven't quite gained that comfort or that stoke to get outside as much. And you can redefine that a little bit if you want. But but let's talk about that intermediate gym to grad climber and what are some 
uh, potential pitfalls here? What are some opportunities for that climber? For like that group of climbers, it would probably be they start letting their guard down a little, mm. like getting not like cocky in a rude way, but like a little arrogant with their ability. Mm -hmm. And you sort of start underestimating. And there is the dreaded fade out on this free intro on Jim DeCrag with the one and only Alex Johnson. I'm so sorry to do that to y'all, but offering up these pro clinics is really one of the main ways I'm able to keep the lights on here in the podcast slash utility closet and also be able to offer up so much free content to the community. So look, there's another 40 plus minutes of expert beta that AJ offers up here. Everything from how to keep from getting injured to crag etiquette that you'll never learn at the gym to how to bust through a plateau and prep for a big outdoor trip. And also perhaps you guys, my most favorite piece of beta yet, how to avoid being that guy at the crag. She really goes on a fantastic rant. I love it, you're gonna love it too. We also wrap up this chat with a really rad dive into how AJ is training up her finger strength and power right now as she recovers from a pretty mega knee injury. She gets super nerdy on her protocol, her programming, and also the biggest mistakes that weekend warriors make when it comes to their finger training. It is all there along with every other pro clinic and bonus episode that I've done for patrons and Apple subscribers. You can either subscribe right there in your Apple Podcast app, if that's how you listen, or if you listen elsewhere, pop on over to patreon.com slash the struggle climbing show to check things out. For the price of a cheap beer each month, you're going to get pro access, early and ad free episodes, swag, and you'll also be supporting me and the climbers who make this pod possible. We're working our harnesses off over here week after week for you. You can cancel anytime, you guys, no worries. I'm grateful for whatever support you can throw my way if you can. And lastly, and this is totally free, y'all, have you checked out the struggle on YouTube? It is blowing up. I'm just so psyched and so grateful for all of the support there. We're releasing two videos a week featuring the likes of Alex Honnold, Tom Randall, Alex Magos, Jonathan Segrist, and today's guest, Alex Johnson. They're like eight minutes long or so and they feature some rad footy supporting the convo that we're having. Been working really hard on this. I hope you like it. Swing over to youtube.com slash at the struggle climbing show and subscribe to be entered into a rad giveaway and also just get access to all those fantastic videos. I hope you like them. The struggle makes us stronger. Have an awesome day, y'all.